Um, let me know when I should start. Actually, uh, at, the, at the start time, so without further ado, let's welcome Aria from UC Berkeley to present us the wonderful false idea and the false torture. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I can't see you, but I, I, uh, I, I can hear you clapping, so I assume you're there, but I, I can't see anyone, so this is a bit weird. <laughs> but I mean, it's like Zoom University, right? Um, anyway, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's nice to talk to people who are like-minded and share our experience. Um, so I'm Arya. I, uh, if I talk too fast, you can tell me to slow down. Um, I'm from New Zealand, so we tend to mumble as well. If you need me to slow down and be more, uh, to enunciate better, just interrupt me and let me know. Um, but yeah, I am a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Uh, I was uh, the TA for the first class. I think it's at least the first, maybe one of the first classes to teach with Skywater 130 in fall 2020. And so that's like two years ago now. Um, this, the class was pretty small. It was about 15 students. Uh, the professor was John Warznick, who's a longtime VLSI person. Um, and we were taking advantage in the end of uh, this, this, I mean, I'm sure everyone's heard of it, but the Google and Skywater collaboration with eFabless, where uh, Skywater open sourced their PDK, and eFabless provided sort of a wrapper for all the open source ASIC tooling. Um, and they prevented, presented this like complete RTL to GDS flow, and they're offering free shuttle runs for anyone who would submit a design. Um, and so then we built a small FPGA and we taped out. I'll go into work. I'll go into detail about that. But it was a lot of work. It was a lot of learning. Um, and just as an immediate disclaimer, I want to say that this was two years ago, and a lot has improved since. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, uh, a bit of background about me. I got a bachelor's degree in New Zealand, uh, and then I worked as a software engineer for about six years, uh, and then I decided to go back to grad school. And so I think this is important because I have a very software engineering mentality when it comes to hardware. I'm an, originally a hardware engineer, right? But I do not like crappy software, and it makes me mad. And I'm very happy to write my own. Uh, I'm much happier to write my own software than I am to use garbage software. So this is kind of part of the problem about software engineers in general. But it meant that when I got to Berkeley, uh, and it's sort of the uh, we'll get to that. When I got to Berkeley, I, I, I did chip design a different way, but we'll, get, we'll go through that. Um, the course itself that we did this for, the CS250, I'll give you a bit of introduction to that. It is a graduate level course. Uh, it's run basically every one or two years, and it's usually quite small, like I said, if we had 15 students. It's open to advanced undergraduates as well, and we had one or two. Uh, but usually by the time people do this course, they have prior experience in digital logic, design software, They've usually done one of the prerequisite courses, which has them do actually a pretty complex RTL design uh, and run it through a bunch of commercial tools. But we give them like a push button flow. Like we give them a make file or we use another tool. Like we have this thing called Hammer that will wrap all of the commercial tooling. And they just have to hit like make blah and it'll do it. They don't have to understand what the tools are doing. It'll just make it for them. That is really an exercise in writing RTL. So by the time they get here, they, they kind of know a bit about how digital design is done. And actually, after that last course, that 151, 251A, they're pretty much qualified to apply for jobs in industry um, as like fresh out of an undergraduate. Uh, so CS250, this graduate course, tries to extend that a bit. It, it creates these like a collaborative group project environment where people apply to split up and do different projects. They're usually things like accelerators or CPU cores or memory controllers. Um, and then we get more stuck into like how to do a better design for fabrication, for like something you want to build, uh, although typically it doesn't actually end up getting fabricated. Um, there's another course for that. Uh, and in my research, uh, which is also like a little bit of background for you, I do computer architecture, so I've been building open source FPGAs at the layout level. And when I had to learn, when I first came here to school, I had to learn how to do chip design, and I was disgusted absolutely disgusted to learn that you had to like you have to use these really crappy well they're not they do fantastic work but these like ancient uis for these commercial like tools that have like, really thick manuals and they only work on specific machines and you need to have licensed servers and someone needs to tell you what bash script to use and there's a lot of tribal knowledge around 
what stuff works with what version of what tool and when, and you could basically just copy their scripts and then you like tweak them a little bit to get things going. Um, we have these ancient uh, but stable operating environments. Uh, what's the type of there? And it, it's just every way you can imagine. It's a pain. Like if you come from like writing software, maybe an SSH, maybe over a terminal. Uh, you log into some box somewhere and you can do it from anywhere. You can do it from the beach. Uh, you can no longer do that if you're trying to build a ship. You've got to you've got to go get a fast connection. You've got a remote desktop to the server in the building with the NDA so that the IP is protected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all very painful. It's like learning Microsoft Word for the first time, except you're no longer like eight years old and you don't really care. Like it's annoying to have to learn all the different shortcuts and the two sets of tools do it differently. So long story short, I did not come to grad school to get a PhD in using vendor tools. I wanted to learn how it's all done, see if I can make it better. Um, so when I was asked to TA CS250 and when there was this opportunity to look into Skywater 130 and OpenLane, I really jumped at it. OpenLane, I don't know, what the audience's background is, but this is the that eFabless suite of tools that RTL to GDS flow. Uh, I really jumped at this because it was a way to achieve the goal, which is to build chips um, without having to go through the hundreds of pages of synopsis or cadence training and like sit in the lab with other people who already knew how to do it. You could figure it out yourself. And that's what makes it such a powerful learning tool. Um, you can really introspect each part of the RTL flow. You can see the code with your own eyes. You can see how it works, and you can try and fix it. Uh, you can run it on your personal machines. You can run it in familiar environments. Uh, you can like, run it, like, students run it on their laptops. Um, you don't have core limits. You can run 20 cores, 100 cores of, of searches at the same time. There's no licensing service. And on top of all that, there's a very active community of very responsive developers, thanks to Fabulous, who will, like, they're very, like, they're very interested in having users try their stuff, and they're always listening to see what would make it better. And so like, if you had a problem, they, they respond pretty quickly. Um, and then the other really nice part is that once you're done, you can share every part of what you did, like down to the GDS. There's no IP limits. You can just give people what you did and say, look at this. What do you think? Look, there's the transistor. Uh, and on top of that, the, the uh, open, sorry, the eFabless harness for the designs was this like really neat, um, uh, they called it Caravel. It was like a design that had space in the middle and around the outside they had the IO pads and they had a little uh, RISC core and uh, SRAMs so that you had you could do bring up without having to worry about uh, IO, your own clock generator, um, your own other controllers or whatever. You could basically just put any design in and plug it into this thing and try and get it to work. That was the promise and it, was, it made it a lot easier and a lot more tractable. Um, so then, uh, okay, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get through so we can have tough questions, but okay, so with that out of the way, how do we do this course? Uh, well, we suggested to the class that we, we build an FPGA, uh, and they, they every, pretty much everyone was like, okay that's, a, that, okay, that's fine. I don't think anyone had a better idea. So I got to pursue my research interests through this course, um, and we had some initial lectures on FPGA design, like stuff you'd read out of a textbook straight away. Uh, and then we had some follow-up lectures on VLSI topics, you know, a review of circuits. This is stuff that I should have covered by now, but uh, we've reviewed it anyway, like MOS models, power, parasitics, clock distribution, et cetera. And we talked a bit about like common blocks, like how SRAMs are made, how MUXs are made. Um, and then we basically split them up into groups and gave them a little task each, which I'll go into. Uh, and then we had regular meetings to discuss progress, uh, share advice, learnings, whatever. We all collaborated in real time with Slack, which was really important because as students, they were usually awake early in the morning, meaning they didn't go to bed. And any normal, regular communication would sort of fail. So I'd be awake at like 10, 11 PM, and then suddenly stuff would start happening. And then I'd have to like help and like I'd figure out what they're doing. Uh, we'd share what we'd learned. Um, we put all the code on GitHub. We enforced a style guide so that people could share it and read each other's code, uh, and that helped people jump from one project to another as they had time. Um, and then ultimately the assessment was based on sort of contribution to the work, uh, both as, you know, by their own admission through personal statements and as judged by our professor. Um, and so then what were the groups? We split, we, like, we took a typical FPGA fabric and we said here are the parts, the parts are like you have configurable logic blocks. Uh, that's the thing with the lookup tables and registers. There's a configuration element, like how do these blocks get configured? Where does that configuration come from? 
just the interconnect between all the configurable logic blocks and the SRAMs and the next thing which I'll talk about. So then there was the SRAM block. Uh, we needed memories, basically. And this ended up being, we didn't ask students to write their own SRAM compiler. Um, luckily, there's OpenRAM. So we asked them to write a wrapper for OpenRAM that would automatically or basically present a unified interface for our FPGA to an OpenRAM SRAM block. Um, and then, of course, a multiply accumulate unit, which is like a configurable with multiplier and accumulator. And then there was like one other team that was in charge of bringing these all together and tiling them and making sure they all worked. Uh, each team, importantly, had to use the flow basically to, to uh, harden their own macro. Like they did the RTL to GDS flow on their RTL, they tested it, they optimized it, they had to iterate on it to make sure it was as dense as possible and, and sort of had the interface that needed. Um, and then they passed that up, up to the integration team and we'd, all, um, we'd combine those together. Uh, we reserved layers of the metal stack for power, routing, ground, clock, and interconnect at the top. And uh, then we said, okay, your team can use the bottom three layers, like the local interconnect layer and the two layers above that to do whatever you need to do. Uh, and so that helped people kind of work independently. And so we divided and conquered. Um, I just want to check that everyone is hearing me okay, because I have no feedback. Yeah. Actually, hey, uh, just, 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 Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I muted the, the, sorry. Uh, everyone here, I just uh, asked around the audience here that is, uh, everyone okay with the, with your talk? They said, yes, they're completely okay with your, your talk and please go on. Okay, cool, great. Um, awesome, we'll keep going. So, yeah, so we split it up and we handed out the different components and then we said, students, please go away and do this. Uh, to start you off, I prepared an introductory lab, which is where I, I said here is an example piece of RTL. Um, we're going to run it through all the open source tools and we're going to generate uh, the final products, the GDS, lift, diff, etc. Um, and that got them familiar with the prerequisites. They got them set up with their uh, environments, like on their laptops or whatever machine they needed to use. If they didn't have a machine, we gave them a lab machine. Uh, they learned some tickle, which it turns out is pervasive in this space. So they learned some tickle. And then, yeah, we, we basically were available. I, I was always listening over Slack. Um, everyone was sharing problems there. We'd like share, like, well, some person would figure something out in the chair. I could try and be one step ahead, so I'd try and try everything once, and then everything I run into, I tell them. Uh, we also actively participated in the open lane slash the Skywater Slack, which was really nice because the developers were right there. Uh, we, yeah, as I said, we share work through GitHub. Um, some students ended up doing custom layout using Magic. So we had a, a, one, one of our interconnects had a transmission gate. Um, we used, as I said, open RAM for the SRAM blocks, and then we had to integrate this with an FPGA tool chain. So we used the open source Yosis and XPNR for the FPGA tool chain. Uh, it was all free, one asterisk. It was all free except one tiny thing. Um, and they, they did it. They, it was incredible. They came out with this, this FPGA. It had uh, these CLBs made of four S44 LUTs, which are like an exotic LUT uh, topology. Um, the interconnect was a bunch of switch boxes and connection boxes, but they connected to their neighbors, like north, east, southwest. Um, the Mac unit was configurable and worked. Everything was functionally tested with like an RTL test bench. Uh, we had various SRAM sizes in the wrapper block. We built the bitstream generator for this thing. Um, it was like hierarchical, so we asked each team to build the, the bitstream generator for their for their block, and then a top-level Python script would combine them all and generate the whole thing, depending on where it was put in the higher like in the layout. Um, yeah, it was it was really cool. Um, the first attempt we had at putting it all together was kind of disastrous. Here we have. We have a four by three, so we got all of twelve of these things on this on this on this die. Uh, we didn't really know how to use the tools well. We hit a lot of bugs. It was very hard 
to get density up. Like we had a lot of problems with congestion, density limits, um, and it was like there was basically no space for other macros at this point. Uh, and then a really interesting thing happened. The students took it upon themselves to make it better because they were so close to the end and they just wanted to optimize it, right? Everyone decided they'd have a go at like running this tool and tweaking the parameters to see, oh, what should the target density be? What should the core utilization be for each block? What if we take the macros out? Uh, and they all sort of went away and they like would constantly be like competing basically over who who had the most dense design today. And then without me having to do much, we got to here. Uh, I mean, I think it was a few heroic students that did most of this, but we went from four by three to eight by seven in the same space. And that's just by figuring out how the tools work better and what their limits are. Um, of course, today this is called you know a hyperparameter search, and you do machine learning of some kind to to search the space for you, for you. But uh, we just had grad students and undergrads, so effectively the same. Um, yeah, but I mean, okay, so this this was the final product, and it was incredible. Uh, but those are, like you can immediately see some problems. Like where are the S ranks? Where are the multiply cumulants? Uh, well, they're not there because we had a bunch of problems. Um, the first real problem we had was, you know, we couldn't map ledges. We had to go and create a mapping for Yosis. It wasn't part of the PDK at the time. That was annoying, but we did it. We had to make them exceptional. We had to hack the open lane scripts up to allow for clockless designs. Um, the open source simulators don't support transmission gate, like the high impedance state, Z. So we had to use Synopsis VCS, which is the asterisk I mentioned before. It's the only non-free tool we have to use, and it's sort of dirty. Uh, in our defense, we could have made the whole thing without the, the transmission gate, and then it would have been completely free. But in this case, it was nice to be able to also do the custom layout. Um, so as I also mentioned, the, the, fl the flow would all often fail with density or congestion issues, and so tweaking these target parameters was very difficult. It was, it's not like, how to put it, You're, you, the, the input is a number, and you don't know what that number means until you read the algorithm that uses it. Um, and not everyone wanted to do that. So for most people, it was a question of, uh, I need a number in a range that works. And the only way to find that range is to just run a sweep of all the values. And for every little change in the input, this range would change. So we did a lot of iteration. Um, of course, I've since learned that this is what people will do in industry anyway. And it seems to be de rigueur. So I guess that's not really a problem. It's just life in building chips. Uh, on top of that, you know, the power delivery network didn't work. I had to go in and manually measure the things and decide where the tracks should go. It's stuff like this. Like the clock tree synthesis would break for large macros because the placement tool couldn't figure out how to move the buffers around the giant macros. So we just ditched the clock tree and we had probably had a lot of clock skew as a result. Um, the SRAM blocks, wow, they didn't end up being available in time. So we had to drop those. I think there was one available, but it was too big. So. <laughs> then the SRAM block on the FPGA would be too big. And so we just had to drop it. Um, likewise, the Mac, because it's just a big thing, it's like, unless we did like an eight by eight or like eight bit inputs, uh, it would have been too big. So we ended up just dropping that too, just to get something out the door. Um, and then lastly, and probably most importantly, the verification tools are very incomplete. They are like, and it's, it's not because well, I think at the time it was because a lot of the timing information or the power models were available, but they weren't quite open source yet, I think, is if I recall correctly, but I may be wrong on that. But either way, we didn't have access to a tool that would let us do design uh, like handoff completely. And so we just had to, and we didn't want to resort to using the commercial tool. So we just said, okay, we'll get it to the state that ECAD response, which is like the following our DRC errors are okay. Um, and they were things that they were aware of. Uh, and then we just handed it over, and we were done. Um, but so that's all very negative. The thing that saved the day was, again, this very supportive and responsive development community, which is exactly why you choose open source. Uh, they were very helpful over Slack. They're really interested in, in um, hearing what our problems were, and they'd respond within 24 hours. Uh, working on the open link, open link code base was reasonably straightforward. Um, we were able to fix code ourselves and submit bug reports or just submit fixes. And actually, since since that time, I think most of these issues, if not all of them, have been fixed, which is great. And that's that's why we believe in open source so much. Um, so 
in conclusion, we did it. We, we submitted this class in, in three months, built this FPGA, and we submitted to MPW1, which is the multi-project wafer. Um, it was fabricated and delivered to us a year later, by which point all the students had left, and I was too busy. So I have a stack of them over there, but I've, I haven't brought them up. There was actually like a bug too in the, the harness, but that didn't matter because the class was a success. We, uh, we knew that using this open source stuff that was brand new was going to be risky. Um, and, you know, it was, it was basically as painful as we expected, but with sort of enough uh, motive, I mean, there's a motivation, with enough curiosity, we like could dig into every problem. The thing that I liked about this that I hate about doing with like, commercial tools is if I had a problem with a commercial tool, I have to contact an application engineer through the support channels of that tool, like the vendor using the like support contract that whatever institution I'm at, I'm at has, I have to wait weeks, I end up in meetings, it takes time, it takes time, nothing gets done. Uh, but here I could just read the code until I figured it out. Um, and that happened a few times. And so we went from like a vague awareness of VLSI design tools and like kind of what each step does to really knowing them well enough to help write our own. Uh, and, and I think the proof was in the fact that the students were all engaged and they all felt accomplished. And I mean, I myself learned a lot, so that was really cool. Uh, by way of comparison, actually, in that same run, uh, the state-of-the-art OpenFPGA uh, compiler at the time, which is this thing called OpenFPGA from I think Utah, University of Utah, uh, they someone was building, uh, someone was designing a, a, a chip using that tool, and what that is, it does is it's basically the same thing. It's a very similar design. You can see it's like a a tile of a tiling of these configurable logic blocks, but they use a they use a cadence tool to, um, I think, do the synthesis placement and routing. So they got a much more dense configurable logic blocks. Oh, so and, so they are using uh, the cadence tool. I, I think that they use the SOFA, the Skywater open source FPGA. But so you are saying that they are not actually using the comp the FOSS tool to, to do the to do the fabrication. No, no. What, so they did a mix, right? They they generated these blocks. I mean, it may be in a different one. I think there were a few FPGAs in there, but this is the one I knew about. They generated each CLB with the cadence tools. And then they tiled them, and then they, I think they tiled them with the free tool, and they put them into the free tool to submit it. Uh, but sort of the core block was done with it. And they also did things like customize each block with a different part of the clock tree so that the clock tree was embedded and that each, because because that tool lets you make each of these CLBs different, you can slightly tweak them to have a different clock buffer or whatever you need. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a bunch more experiences behind this tool. This is like state of the art. Um, and we got in the same ballpark with seven teams of about two students in three months. And I think that was, that was really nice for the students to see. Um, it's clearly not better, but it's like to even be at that level, I thought I was really impressed. Um, other lessons I think I've kind of beaten the bush about, but basically it may be rough around the edges, but it is all absolutely worth doing. Uh, a lot of the students really liked playing with the tools and not just using them, and because a lot, of, a lot of people, especially engineers, right, will learn by doing. Uh, it is much easier to say, here's the script that runs, you can see what each part does, tweak it until the thing works, then here is a make file, good luck. We don't know what this block does or this binary or whatever, we don't know what's going on here. Um, yeah, so that was really cool. And as for what's next, I think I was really excited uh, at the time to sort of turn this into a shared open source uh, course based on Skywater 130. Um, but it turned out to be very hard to keep up with the software changes by myself. It really needed like a community that would be constantly changing it. And you know, almost with these like software engineering practices of if we change the API, if we change the flow, if we change a configuration parameter, we've got to change the course where we teach how to use it. It's part of maybe it's part of the continuous integration. Um, it was kind of too early, I think, in spring 2021 to do that, but maybe now there's more appetite to develop a shared course. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, there's another the, there's this tape out class at Berkeley, which is sort of more aggressive, has broader scope. It it they tend to build like a a radio chip with a processor on it. Like they have an analog front end and they have a um, uh, like a risk core or something on there. And they typically will tape out with commercial tools because they'll have very experienced grad students come and like tell them 
this is exactly what you need to do, and here's like you do this bit, you do this bit, we'll put it together, we'll we'll tape it out. Uh, they were considering Skywater 130 adoption. I don't think it was mature enough for them in 2021, but I think they're still thinking about it. And I think if we can get a uh, a course like that to use Skywater 130, then that's a huge boon because they really care about you know the the big tick at the end when LVS is clean and DRC is clean and uh, all the timing passes and like across all the corners. So uh, yeah, I, I think that's a sort of the next step for like. A more advanced course. Oh, oh shit! Thanks, of course, to everyone in the open source community. Um, these tools are—they uh, take a lot of basically volunteer hours, and we're grateful for them. Sorry, sorry. They're very responsive people. Sorry, and, yeah. Can, can, can you go back to one or two pages? Next page, sorry. Yeah, this one uh, because we're we're going we're having a little in in connection outbreak. So can you s just re uh, kind of replay these two kind of <laughs> slides? I'm oh, so sorry. Hi, here, sorry. Yeah, this speaking too fast again. I, um, these are the these are the students in the class, and I wanted to thank them. I'm not going to name them each, but this is full credit where it's due. These were the people who did it, uh, and. On this slide, I wanted to acknowledge that like all of this work was built on a lot of volunteer work by members of the open source community, of course Google for its funding of Skywater and Efabless to do this, um, OpenRAM, Klayout, a lot of the other stuff we take for granted. Uh, uh, Tim Edwards especially has a lot of, he's taken on the maintenance of a lot of old BLSI tools like Magic. Uh, and then a lot of the developers involved were very helpful, they really kind of held our hand through bits of it. And that I think, I mean, we all helped each other, right? Like we helped them pipe clean this process and try and get it done and like see what the uh, the rough edges are. And they helped us learn a lot. So it was really cool. Yeah, questions. Yeah. So, uh, is it Bo Ming? Is it Bo Ming? Is it Bo Ming? Is it Bo Ming? Is it Okay. Uh, we're having a light one here. So I'm passing the mic here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I want to say that uh, during your case, do you face any bugs in the software? Because in my experience, I think the open source tool has a lot of limitation and some issue. And also in the verification, uh, I think that the difficulty of the verification is that you need a lot of uh, domain knowledge, like the RC, how to extract them and uh, it's uh, it's hard, uh, tightly uh, related to the uh, hardware behavior. So uh, in software level, we don't know the this kind of terminology. So how do we come with the this kind of problem in open source tools? Um, so the first question: Do we find bugs? Yes, we absolutely found a lot of bugs. Um, I mentioned them. They are. Oh. Yeah, uh, some of the bugs were, you know, just features that hadn't been added, so they weren't really bugs, they were just things that were missing, like, for example, not having clocks. But then, every now and then, we'd hit, like, a stake fault in, like, the, the router, or the, the placer or something, and then that's when we'd say, hey, developers, we hit this bug with this case, and they were very, like, very quick to respond, it'd be fixed within a few days. Um, of course, this is a benefit of being one of the first people and everyone being very focused, of course. I don't think that necessarily scales, but I, I still think the turnaround when you hit a bug in the open source tools, like with, with the current community, is faster than if you hit it with a commercial tool. Admittedly, the commercial tools are already much more stable, but they didn't really frustrate us that much. I think the thing that frustrated us the most was sort of how hard it was to uh, get the tools, like to tweak the parameters for the tools because we didn't know what they did and it wasn't like there wasn't any intuitive sense of how to get them to do what you want. Um, and I think this is true also of commercial tools, but they come with a lot more guidance and direction. Like the manual will say, use this flag if you want to do this sort of thing. And then you get people with enough experience and that becomes less of a problem. But yeah, I think that that is still like a big gap with the open source tools. Um, your second question was about verification. I think verification was a big problem. Uh, 
we really we had to trust that if the design was okay through the tools and uh, if Atlas accepted it, like it passed their tests, which was just like a DRC check, uh, then it would be okay. Um, and then, I mean, it would be okay in some sense, but yeah, functionally, we had no way of verifying that uh, the timing would be met at the gate level. Like we didn't, we didn't know if the clock skew would be too great. We didn't know if it would work really. Uh, that is a big problem, but I think for for teaching how to do and what these things do, so teaching all these steps and to, to teach what is necessary to get a chip to work, um, especially at the level of this course, this was fine. I think the next step is if you're you know, a grad student and you want to take something out, you want to build it, uh, you, you tend to spend a lot of time on verification because it matters. It's a lot of your time, you don't want to repeat it. If you're a commercial entity, then even more so, you don't want to waste time and money. Um, the thing that makes that easier to swallow is that it's free. So it doesn't matter because someone else is paying for the, the shuttle uh, and you can do another one in a few months time. Um, and as long as that is true, I think we can get away with having kind of poor verification. Uh, I mean, obviously it's not gonna be the same quality or robustness or reliability of chip as something you might produce commercially, but I think uh, it is easy enough to use today that that doesn't need to be a problem for especially university courses for like people learning, right? Um, but otherwise, yeah, I agree. I mean, we had the same issue. Sorry, uh, Ali, Aria, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we have another question here. Sorry that the, that the interaction is some kind of a little bit hiccup, it's okay. Uh, hi, Arya. Thank you for uh, a fascinating presentation. Um, my question is not fully formed right now, so uh, just take what you will and um, and let's see what your thoughts are. Uh, have you ever thought about how you would extend uh, a course like this to say a less um, a less privileged uh, education environment or a completely uh, an open environment where there's no uh, curriculum or a no um, no payoff in the in the in the form of a, uh, a course credit or 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 even a, a tape out kind of product, such that you know someone who's kind of interested, but um, as you earlier mentioned, um, you had like a buddy system where uh, teams would um, you know, there were two people per team, and you also mentioned that your students had a kind of grit that they would power through problems that are or or you know learn t tickle to solve problems, things like that. Um, if you don't have these things. Or you don't have uh, students of um, that much motivation, but you're you're faced with a, a less um, economically endowed environment. Um, how would you how would you bring this uh, this learning? Yeah. Uh, so, thank you. I think. Yeah. Thanks for your question. I think the 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 differences with this sort of quote, you know, like a, yeah, an economically less well off or like a an institution. I don't know where people don't have the same self-belief maybe um, to getting this done and making this useful. I think I think the difference, the first difference really is in uh, the background. So we gave the students very, I think, little and then trusted that because they made it basically to the end of their degree, they kind of figure the rest out. Like we gave them, I think they had to build in some introduction on how to do it. They went and designed it, and they generated a, the RTL description and so on. But like the first thing you could do, for example, is you could say, like, here is RTL. This is what it does. Here are a bunch of examples that we've made for you, um, and you can sort of like dip your toes in the water without saying, like, good luck, make it all work. See you later. Small accelerator, tweak it so that it's like it has a wider input bus or a wider output bus or something, or like even simpler designs, right? And I think there's a, a tremendous um, spectrum of designs that are very accessible, especially to people who are new to digital design, things like adders uh, or like counters, the stuff that I like. I So I learned in New Zealand and th this kind of course would have been my dream, right? Um, if I had been given something like for free like this on the internet where I could just take like an existing design and I could play with it without really knowing it, then I could have used I could have let my own curiosity flourish, and I would hope that uh, that could, that's what we could translate here. Like, say I say I packaged this course in a way that was like, okay, we're gonna get like we're trying to teach you how chips are made, um, 
we're going to give you an example input and you're going to see an example output. And then depending on how curious you are, you can go and make the input more and more complicated and you can try and optimize the output more and more. And that's sort of up to you, but we don't expect you to like know a lot of stuff. Um, so I think you could just do a lot more handholding. You could say, like, we, we got this design pretty dialed in, um, but we want you to like extend it a bit or change a bit of it and see what happens. And then you still get a flavor of, you know, what is happening and why uh, and what matters in the output. Like, it's, it's, it's very exciting to me, just it's kind of nerdy, right? Like, to see GDS, to see the layout, I think that's super cool. Because when I grew up and I learned about chip design, I was like, damn, how do we, this is incredible, how do we do this? Uh, and so just like, I, th I think especially in, in, in general in education, you want to give people like little tasters of things so that they they latch on to something that excites them and then that becomes their passion and they use that to fuel their energy, like the motivation to learn. Um, I'm also sort of <laughs> ad-libbing here. I, I think it's a really interesting question. I definitely think we can do it. And I think it comes down to uh, removing assumptions about what people know and reducing the scope of what they need to do to get anything out of it, right? So as long as it's a smaller design and they can see anything of the output and they can learn something, I think that's worth doing. And of course, this stuff is free. Google hosts a lot of this in their um, collab environment. Uh, so you can run, you can actually run eFabless just for free on one of their no in one of their like Jupyter like notebooks. Um, and otherwise, you can just you can run it on any old uh, like laptop or any old computing device. It may be very slow, but you can still do it. Uh, so I think in many ways, this is a huge step forward to making chip design accessible. We just have to get the framing right, I guess. I see. Uh, do, do we have any questions here? Okay, just come here, come, come, come forward, come forward, because, you know, the camera cannot be turned around. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, now I'm working at the EDA company. I know if if EDA software have any bug when you run it. Uh -huh. uh, do, do, do you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and now I'm working at the ED company. I know if if your if your EDA, EDA software have any bugs. You will lose much, much money. So my question is, how do in your community do you have someone who can help you verify quality of software? Um. Yes. So that's a good question. Uh, I. That's a question for eFabless, really. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah right. Groups that make. Let, let me let me uh, just explain a little bit that uh, during since our announcement of your talk, many EDA companies and fabs are concerned that oh, you know, the slot, the MPW shuttle is very very expensive. How a uh, fabulous like Skywater can uh, pay up for kind of the supposedly to be failed slots? <laughs> That's a lot of money to be burned. Oh, <laughs> I think it? Google sponsors them. Google sponsors them, right? So that. Google is providing this money um, to encourage the software to be built around the capability. So they've dangled this carrot, which is you get a free shuttle run if you submit to it, but you've got to use our tools, basically, and you've got to help us build this uh, ecosystem. Um, and to the earlier question, yes, I think uh, the, well, I've never heard of, I mean, they must exist, but typically I think the way open source community projects work is people have to check each other more than there is someone in charge of quality. I think very large projects have people in charge of quality. They have the like, the, you know, the chieftains who like decide um, whether something is good or bad, like for example, the Linux kernel. But in this case, I don't think that exists. I think it's sort of down to the developers to sort of hold themselves to some standards. And then people who are constantly checking their code because it's in the open, keep them in check as well. Um, it's like a very different model to the commercial. So I was a professional software engineer and we did very rigorous code review. We had product managers, we had project managers, et cetera, and everyone be checking each other's work all the time. We had testers. This is not like it. This is, you're letting it to people who um, are interested in seeing it work, making it work a tiny bit at the time. And it may be slower, but I think it works. And I think the proof is things like GCC and Linux kernel and all the other software suites we have. Yeah. 
I see. Thank you a lot because we're having three more minutes until the another talk. So I will quick, quick. Uh, can you share some 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 videos? Some some audience here are asking that. Can you share your slides uh, so they can go around and see your, see your slides? <laughs> Is it possible? Oh yeah, sure. I will. I will send. Yeah, I can. If you, I don't know where to send them, but I'll, I'll uh, do that. Uh, maybe through the email later or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. If you just send me a follow-up email, I'll just send you a reply. I see. Okay, so... Oh, I'll just email you now, actually. I'll just email you now. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, thanks very much for yeah, having thank me. Um, if there are any more questions, then uh, that was great. Thanks for listening. Sorry for... Hope I had something for interesting for everyone. Um, but, yeah. If you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, I'll put my email on the slides. Other oh, my emails are on the slides. What, whatever you need, I'm happy to answer questions. I see. So yeah, thank you so much, and we'll be all right here. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Right, thanks, Rylan. Bye. Bye. Because I have to hold the next round. 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 Hi, Hugh. Can you hear me? Hey, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you for joining us so late in the, you know, in the, in the States. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was, I was leaving. I just forgot. Yeah. All right. Uh, so will you be showing the screen, or should I pay, play the video you sent me? Is, uh, other way, it's video. Video? OK, so I will yeah. play the video. and. Uh, can you hold up to the live Q&A, or you, or, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, so I will play the video here, just give me All a right. second. Alright, here. Hey, so I'd like to present Barry GPU. Uh, so what is very GPU? Very GPU is work to create an open source GPU ASIC. So we're explicitly targeting ASIC, not FPGA. We want it to be fast. It's only for machine learning, and we want to primarily use open source tooling. Uh, so what are some of the motivations or end games for this? Like taping out an ASIC is very expensive, like millions of dollars. I'm not going to pay for that. So how to handle that. So what I'm imagining in my head is that if, 
if someone wants to today create a, a startup that distributes, creates, manufactures a GPU, they have to design that GPU and verify that GPU, and that's a significant barrier to entry. It's a significant hurdle that they have to overcome. Now, if we can create an open source GPU that's fully verified, that people know, okay, if I can get the money to take this out, it's going to work, that's, that significantly reduces the barrier to entry to creating a startup that creates a GPU. So then there's like two possible ways forward I see. So one is like someone creates a startup, gets VC, tapes it out and distributes it. And then another is like a large company like say Facebook uh, could tape it out and distribute it. Why might Facebook do that? Well, that, that creates an alternative to like Google's TPU, for example. Maybe. Some design decisions. We're explicitly targeting FPGA. So in the past, I had some OpenCL projects where I would develop the projects on NVIDIA GPUs. And they worked pretty well on NVIDIA GPUs, but when I tried them on, a, on AMD GPUs, because I'd spent all my time optimizing for NVIDIA, they ran pretty slowly on the AMD. So what I want to avoid is if I target FPGAs or I test on FPGAs, I will naturally over time optimize for FPGAs. There are things you can do on FPGAs that you can't do on ASICs and vice versa. If I'm targeting FPGAs, I won't be using the full capabilities of the ASIC and I will naturally be optimizing for F FPGA. So I'm just not going to do FPGAs at all, like only ASIC and, and simulation. Uh, for us, machine learning. Right now, because we're targeting machine learning, that means there's some optimizations that we can do. So recently, there is a type of float called BrainFloat16, BF16. This is becoming quite popular in large models like transformers, very large language models. It has the same dynamic range as FP32, but it uses fewer bits, and so the calculations, everything, space, memory transfer, everything goes faster. So I want to only, only target BF16. No FP16, no FP32, no FP64. So for example, NVIDIA GPUs, they're going, they have to do like all of these. They have to do BF16, FP16, FP32, FP64. And that uses a lot of extra die space and it reduces the yield. All right? So by only doing BF16, we, we save die space, we increase the yield. Similarly, for the FP operators, there are some operators that are needed by machine learning, specifically logarithms, exponential, or possibly Tanha. Uh, but there's a, a lot of other operators that we don't need for machine learning, for running transforms and so on. So we can just not implement those. That saves more dev space and increases the yield. Right, and then I wanted to work with PyTorch. So there are a number of deep learning frameworks out there. So TensorFlow is one, PyTorch is another, and there are others. I'm choosing PyTorch. I've used PyTorch a lot, I'm very familiar with it. It's used extensively in both industry and in research. So yeah, this is my choice. That doesn't mean that we couldn't also get very GP working on TensorFlow. I'm just only targeting PyTorch. Um, and we wanted to use primarily open source tooling. All right, so here is like the end-to-end -end planned architecture. This screen is split into two halves. So on the left-hand side over here, we've got like the main board, the PC, the, the main host computer. And the right hand side we've got the GPU card. And the GPU card comprises like we've got DDI global memory on the card, and then we've got the GPU die itself, which is the ASIC that we're taking out. Uh, so on the left we've got PyTorch that communicates using a PIP, PIP API with our host side runtime. And then that host side runtime is going to handle things like virtual memory, transferring data to and from the GPU from the main memory, um, and like launching kernels. That's going to communicate through PCIe to the GPU controller that sits on the die. The GPU controller is going to similarly handle like virtual memory, uh, starting and stopping uh, kernels and so on. Uh, we've also got a compute unit which contains multiple GPU cores. Uh, we've got DDR controller and then we've got DDR global memory that sits on the card, not on the die. Um, and then some shared memory. There's also some risk-free kernels, all right? So PyTorch, when you can compile, when you compile PyTorch, it's going to compile the GPU kernels at the time of compilation. So these could be CUDA kernels compiled into like the CUDA ISA. It could be um, AMD HIP kernels compiled into the HIP ISA. We are using RISC-V, so we need the GPU kernels to be compiled into a RISC-V. All right, so of this architecture, what exists now and uh, what is to do? In blue, we've got the things that exist now, and in yellow are the things that we need to do. So. We've got the host side runtime, so that exists. We can already run C++ programs with GPU kernels in, 
those GPU kernels will be transferred to what, what I'm running in simulation, right? To the simulated GPU and will then run in the simulated GPU core. Uh, we've got a GPU controller which handles the other side of the communication, sits on the die. Uh, we've got a GPU core which handles like basic arithmetic, int and FB. Currently FB32, we need to migrate that to FB16. We don't have the PCI interface or the DDR controller and currently we haven't compiled these RISC-V kernels for PyTorch. Uh, okay, right, so then some design decisions. So there are other design decisions, but these are the decision, design decisions that I found, felt the answers were less, least clear to me. So I had to think about these more than many other design decisions. Uh, so we've got how to work with PyTorch. Uh, well, actually, ISO choice and design is relatively straightforward with some nuance. Uh, how to handle the DDR memory and PCI link, and do we need network on a chip? All right, so how to make it work with PyTorch? Right, so there's a few options here. So one is to integrate directly with PyTorch. So we couple it directly into PyTorch. We modify PyTorch to call directly into our very GPU code. The issue with this is lots of development would, would be needed, and PyTorch will push back because we're not using a standard interface. A, a fairly tempting on the surface option is to use OpenCL. Why, why does it appear tempting? Well, because it's an open standard. However, we would still need lots of development because PyTorch doesn't yet work with OpenCL. Now, there is a lone developer working on migrating PyTorch to work with OpenCL. That work is in development. Now, even if they succeeded, a challenge, a fundamental limitation with OpenCL is that OpenCL needs to work across many platforms and many vendors. That means whenever any functionality is implemented, it involves discussion with like 15, 17 vendors around a table and they all have little things that they want to do and change. So the result is the standard has to handle all of these different vendors and requirements, which makes it quite complicated and it's hard to implement OpenCL quickly. Whereas, for example, CUDA is relatively simple, only has to target a single vendor so they can optimize that highly just implement the minimum things to do what they need to do without having to handle other vendors' requirements. Right, so CUDA. CUDA is tempting because it already works with PyTorch. It's kind of a de facto standard for machine learning GPUs. I would say the main challenge here is how to defend against uh, cease and desist from NVIDIA, right, because it's their IP. And another challenge which sort of goes hand in hand with this is I don't like to, I, I avoid, if I'm working on anything where I'm doing like open source using CUDA, like I have a project, I have an open source project called Coriander where I take CUDA kernels and then I compile them into OpenCL. Now, this sort of works. A challenge I found was that I didn't feel that I had the right to read the CUDA API doc. So the only way I could learn about the CUDA API was by reading other programs that used CUDA and therefore by, for compatibility purposes, I feel that I have a fair use to look at how they're using the API, but obviously this is very convoluted and quite hard. So, right, so I'm avoiding CUDA here. I mean, I nearly chose CUDA, but like AMD HIP, so AMD HIP is basically CUDA API, but all the words CUDA replaced by like HIP in all of the API calls. So it's basically the similar API, but just with slightly different names. It's open source under an MIT license. It's already supported by 12 PyTorch. It's very similar to CUDA. I feel that there's not much risk of being sent to cease and desist by NVIDIA. If they were going to do that, they would already do that to AMD. Even if NVIDIA did that to me, I feel that AMD might help pay for my defense. Because if I had to retract mine, then that would be evidence that AMD would have to retract theirs. All right, so I'm choosing AMD here. Uh, it's sort of a compromise decision, but I feel like it's open source. It's it's already sort of supported by PyTorch, and there's little IP litigation risk, relatively small IP litigation risk, I feel. All right, I said choice in design. So using RISC, RISC-V, this is very popular recently. Many projects are using it. It's very nice to use. I'm, I'm enjoying using it. I'm using the ZFINX extension so that we unify the float and the integer register file. We might need to break with RISC-V in order to migrate to the BrainFloat 16. Now, there might be an extension already for BrainFloat 16, 
If there is, that's good. I want to know about that. Uh, I haven't found one yet, although I haven't searched incredibly hard, I have to say. But yeah, if you know of an extension. Otherwise, I might have to create my own extension, maybe, potentially. But I will probably have to, therefore, modify like LLVM and all of these things in order to handle the extent. All right, how to handle DDR memory and PCIe link. Right, so I don't want the DDR controller and the PCI interface to be in very GPU. I feel that these are standard components, and I feel that the appropriate way to handle these is to just drop in some third-party IP. So whoever tapes the GPU out, they can get hold of a third-party IP controller for DDR and an interface for PCI and just drop those into the design. I feel that um, getting hold of a GPU that's kind of challenging. Getting hold of a GPU design that's verified, etc. that's kind of challenging. But getting hold of a DDR controller, PCI interface, I feel there should be some out there um, and they can just be dropped into the design. I don't see any point in, in like bundling those in with the very GPU. So keep those factorized out. As far as how to talk with those, so I'm going to use Axie 4 because this is a fairly standard interface in industry. Uh, however, it seems like Axie 4 is not sufficient to fully specify the interface as far as I can tell. So there's probably still going to be some controller specific integration somehow. Uh, if anyone knows like a standard way of interfacing with DDR memory controller and PCI interface, I, I would be very interested to know that. As far as I know, there will be some controller specific integration. Uh, do we need network on a chip? So I'm reliably informed that yes, we do. However, I'm not sure about this. Like, I feel that the GPU is sufficiently hierarchical that maybe we don't need network on a chip. But like all of the cores, they sit in a compute unit. So the cores communicate with the compute unit, communi compute unit communicates with units above that. So I'm not sure that we need the network on a chip. I'm not sure. I'll see, I'll find out. So what's working? So single source compilation works. So you can write some C++ that contains a GPU kernel. You can compile that that kernel can then be run on the simulated GPU. This all works today. Um, the compilation is using Clang LLVM to split out the GPU kernel from the host side code and then compile that kernel into RISC-V. We need to provide a runtime library and I'm providing a, a, a HIP compatible runtime library. The HIP runtime library handles things like virtual memory allocation for the GPU. Uh, transferring data to and from the GPU, transferring the kernel to the GPU, and launching the kernel. So this exists today, this works today. A basic GPU core. So we've got a basic GPU core. It's using the RISC-V ISA. It's got ancient FB32 arithmetic. It's got a relatively fast propagation delay, I feel. Uh, things that, um, <clears throat> that we need to add in are uh, instruction parallelism, we currently don't have. Don't have. Uh, caching, we need to add in caching. Currently is using FB32, we need to migrate to the brain flow 16. And there's some floating point operations we need to add, specifically exponential, logarithm, and tan, tanha, maybe a couple of others. Things we don't need or want, we don't want super scalar execution, because this uses absolute tons of dice. Bit. This is great, because then we don't have to implement super scalar execution. So we don't need to do out of order or, learning, or micro operations or any of these things. Right? That's gone. So it's relatively simple. We want the GPU core to be relatively simple because then it takes up a small amount of die error. We're going to have thousands of these on the GPU die, so they all have to be relatively small and simple. So this makes our life easier. Uh, GPU controller. So the GPU, GPU controller sits on the GPU die, and that communicates with the host side run side library, runtime library. Um, it handles copying data between the GPU global memory and host side memory in either direction. Um, sending kernels to the GPU compute unit and launching them. So that's working today. PyTorch to do. So PyTorch is compiled for AMD. Well, it's compiled for CUDA, and you can also compile it for AMD HIP. When it's compiled for AMD HIP, the kernels are compiled into the AMD ISA. So those won't run on our GPU because we leave them compiled to the risk v ISA. Now, more or less, what we just need to do is to recompile PyTorch using our own <coughs> runtime and libraries. However, we need to create those libraries so that when we compile PyTorch, it will compile into RISC-V. This needs a bit of tweaking and hacking around. I've done something similar because in my project where I took Q2 
theater kernels and brothers into OpenCL is kind of similar, actually harder, so this is easier than that. It's doable, but it will need a certain amount of time. It's not just like an hour of like typing dot slash configure or something like that. There will actually need to be some modifications in header files and definitions created and, and modified and so on in order to do this. But it, it's doable. All right, so verification. So if we want people to take this out, spend millions of dollars on it, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars, we need to show that it's going to work. Right? It's not enough just to write some code and say, well, I guess it works. We need to prove or make it very certain that if it's taped out, it's actually going to run. Um, in industry, 80% of development effort slash money slash time goes into verification, not into writing the code. And creating unit tests as I go along, they all run currently in Icarus Verilog. Um, and then some, are, some of these have been ported to Verilog. I'm sort of porting more and more as I go. Uh, one of the biggest challenges I've faced so far is uninitialized X values. These are quite hard to detect, I find. Uh, one way to detect them is to use gate level simulation with iVerilog. This catches quite a few, but not all. Uh, I also experiment with using like asserts with iVerilog. That also catches some, but again, not all. There's many edge cases and corner cases. What I'm finding works quite reliably is random initialization with Verilator. So Verilator can Whenever there's some new wire created, it, it, you can tell it, all right, just initialize it with a random value. So sometimes it'll be zero, sometimes it all will. If you run it enough times with the random initialization, a failure to initialize will manifest in a fail, failing unit. These failures can be hard to track down, but at least we know there's a bug to fix. I feel it's vastly preferable to know there's a bug somewhere and to have to spend some time tracking that down compared to not knowing there's a bug at all. And if we run the test many times and we don't manifest any bugs, then we can be reasonably confident that the initializations are working okay. Not entirely 100% because there's a sort of like probabilistic element here, but I feel that it works fairly well. All right, so unit test and initialization. Uh, all right, performance. So there's three measures of performance that we care about. One is propagation delay, one is die area, and one is cycle count. So propagation delay, is the time for the, at each clock cycle, um, any changes in flip-flops inputs has to propagate through our combinatorial logic, and that takes a certain amount of time, which is the propagation delay. The propagation delay uh, controls how fast we can set our clock speed. So the, the faster the propagation delay, the higher the clock speed we can use, and the faster we can run our GPU. The cycle count is the number of cycles to run a particular instruction. So the cycle count combined with the propagation delay basically decides how fast our GPU is going to run. And then die area factors factorizes into cost. Like the, the more die area, the higher the cost of taping out, and the lower the yield. So the smaller the die area, yield goes up, cost of taping out goes down, so overall cost goes down. For the propagation delay and the die area, so I believe that you can use like OpenStar slash timer to do this. However, I wasn't able to figure out how to get that working. I sort of tried a bit, I didn't figure out. What I'm doing is I'm using YoSys to synthesize down to a gate level netlist. I'm not doing layout here. I'm using the structure of the logic gates, like the network of logic gates, as a proxy for how much time, how much time will be in the propagation delay. And, and the diary, but this doesn't take into account things like wire lengths and layout. So it's just a proxy. To actually get the actual exact propagation delay and diary, I would need to run layout, which I'm currently not doing, but will obviously do in the future. So I'm using doses to synthesize down to a gate level analyst. I'm using an open source 90 nanometer cell library called SAD EDK90 to do this. This is provided by Synapsis, which is very nice of them. But yeah, it's open source, it's, it's not IP encumbered, so we can fairly use that. And then what I'm doing is I'm, well, I have a custom script that walks the netlist. And what I'm doing is I'm calculating propagation delay in units of NAND gate propagation delay. All right, so what is NAND gate propagation delay? It's the propagation delay of a single NAND gate. So if we have one NAND gate, then the NAND gate propagation delay is one. If we have two NAND gates, one after the other, then it's two. If we had a NAND gate followed by a NOT gate, so a NOT gate propagation delay is about 0 0.6 times a NAND gate propagation delay. So a NAND followed by a NOT is about 1.6 NAND gate propagation delay. 
And this should be fairly node technology independent. Like whether we're using five nanometer or 90 nanometer, a NOT gate is about 0.6, the propagation rate of a NAND gate. Not exactly, but approximately ballpark. So basically, by calculation of like NAND gate propagation delay, is I feel it feel a fairly reasonable proxy to be able to judge, okay, this implementation is faster than this. I don't know the exact propagation delay, and depending on layout, like actually the relative rankings might not be quite the same, but hopefully it's a reasonable proxy to be able to choose a faster circuit over a slower circuit. And similarly, the diarrhea I calculate in terms of NAND gate diarrhea. So if we've got two NAND gates, that's two NAND gate diarrhea. So again, we're not doing layout, we're not taking into account wires, and we're not taking into account like power lines. Okay, but I feel it might be a reasonable proxy uh, in order to get some indication of propagation delay and diarrhea. And then cycle count is easy to measure, it's just the number of clock cycles for particular test programs. So we run a test program like say matrix multiplication, and how many clock cycles does that take? All right, so this is performance. Uh, so all of these like tests run on a CI server using Circle CI, which is free for open source projects. Basically, every commit it runs the, it calculates the measures the propagation delay, the die area, and the cycle count, as run as well as running the unit tests for the verification. Uh, we actually have like integration tests and stuff too. Uh, all right, what open source tooling am I using? So I'm using Icarus Verilog, which is a simulator, Verilator, which is another simulator, and Yosis, which is a synthesizer. So what are the good and bad points about these? So Icarus Verilog is, is very easy to use. Uh, it generates compiles code very quickly, and you can write test cases in Verilog, which is super nice. The bad points is it has limited support for system Verilog. So I, I feel that it was written a while ago, and it hasn't been updated much for system Verilog. It's got a strict GPLv2 license. Now, this is not an issue if we're only using Verilog. However, I want to be running simulations from PyTorch from C++, which means I need to link my C++ code or the PyTorch code to the iVerilog library. If we need to link this together and the library is GPLv2, that means my code needs to be GPLv2 too. I want my code to be under a more open license at MIT, so I want to avoid linking with the GPLv2 iVerilog library. Um, it's also unclear to me how to guarantee detection of initialization errors when we're using I Verilog. Now moving on to Verilator. Good points of Verilator. It's got a really great reputation in the industry. It runs quickly. Now I say it runs quickly. It compiles and generates relatively slowly, but once it's compiled and generated, it runs quickly. It's got a relatively unrestricted license, the lesser GPLv2. So we can freely link to LGPLv2 code without our code needing itself to be LGPLv2. So this is great for VPI uh, linking with C++. I find that it detects initialization errors reliably using the random initialization. It's easy to link with C++, which is great for when we're running like PyTorch against our simulated GPU. And system Verilog support is underway. Bad points. So the system Verilog support is still in progress. Uh, compilation generation is fairly slow. And it's hard to configure. Like you have to set up some files, a whole bunch of code in order to run anything at all, compared to iVerilog, where you can just run it on the command line. It's super easy. Um, and you can't create standard Verilog test bench unit tests. Now, you can kind of tweak, hack around your Verilog so that most of your testing IP is in Verilog, and then the C++ is just a very thin shell on top of that. However, you end up with the, the resulting Verilog code is not as intuitive to understand and to read it to maintain as if the whole thing is written in Verilog. That said, because of the advantages of Verilator, the relatively unrestricted license, and the detection of the initialization errors, I'm gradually moving my tests into Verilator and moving into Verilator. And then Yosis is a synthesizer. So Yosis is really amazing synthesizer. Like, it's awesome. I haven't discovered a bug in it yet. Right? Sometimes I find a bug and I'm like, oh, I finally found, I found a bug in Yosis, but it's always a bug in my own code. It's always something I've done wrong in my own code. So yeah, Yosis just works really well. It's very reliable. Uh, it can handle a very diverse space of Verilog code. It doesn't handle system Verilog, so you have to feed it Verilog. But if you feed it Verilog, it can handle a diverse space of Verilog. Um, if it can't handle something, it will say. It will say, oh, I can't handle that. It won't just give you the wrong answer. So either it will give you the right answer, which is the vast majority of the time, or it will say, oh, I can't handle the input. You need to change something. And it will tell you approximately what you need to change. 
bad points, as for all of these tools, uh, limited support for system very low. Right, now there's some tooling I tried, but I haven't used yet. So one is OpenStar Timer, uh, one is SVTV, and one is Qflow. So OpenStar Timer, like, as far as I know, it can be used to measure the propagation delay. It might also handle layout, I'm not sure. Anyway, I couldn't like, get it to work. Maybe I'm using it wrongly, but it, I couldn't get it to work for myself. So yeah, so I'm not using that currently, but maybe in the future. SV2V, so SV2V is a very nice uh, project. It takes system Verilog and it converts it into Verilog. So then we can then feed that Verilog into all these other tools that only support Verilog. So the good point is it works with system Verilog. Bad point is when something goes wrong, it dumps you into the generated Verilog. So when I have an error, I get dumped into generated code that I didn't write. So I have two sets of code. The system Verilog that I wrote and know intimately and understand very well, and then whenever I get an error, I get dumped into code I didn't write and that's generated, which is quite challenging. I sort of tried that for a while, but personally, currently, I find it more effort to deal with the dual code than to simply write everything in Verilog, keep everything in Verilog, the sort of lowest common denominator across all the tools I'm using. But I do like the idea of SVTV. I feel it would be nice if uh, it would be really nice if SV2V could do what it does and then somehow dump you into the system Verilog when there's an error, along with a system Verilog related error, rather than dumping into the generated Verilog, maybe. Uh, Qflow. So Qflow is a, is a layout software. As far as I know, it's the only open source layout tool, uh, although it may be open star timer handles layout too, I'm not sure. Uh, bad points, I couldn't, I found it hard to use. I tried it with like a very simple example, like one NAND gate or something like that, and I, and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm probably just using it wrongly, but yeah, like I, I, I'm not using it currently. I will probably use it in the future and figure out how to use it, because basically as far as I know, it, it's the only open source layout tool. So gaps and opportunities for open source. So system bear log support. So I need a DDR5.6 controller and a PCI interface. A BMAN block generator. So as far as I know, all BMAN block generators are all provided by the Foundry. Now I'm wondering if there's a way that we could have like an open source BMAN block generator, which is somehow Foundry independent. And I don't know if this is possible, but like we have like these languages that support creating like logic gates that become like logic cells, which then get changed into the Foundry stuff. Uh, I wonder if we can do something similar for BMAN block generator. I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing that out there. And an easy to run chip layout generator. Right, so system Verilog support, this could be adding support to existing tools. It could be uh, tweaking SV2V so the workflow stays within the system Verilog code. DDR5 and 6 controller. Uh, so ideally with a full verification suite. So when someone takes out the chip, they don't want to just take a, a DDR controller that has just been developed a bit and there's no guarantee that that's going to work because the 80% of development effort for ASICs is on verification. So if they have to write the verification themselves, like that's 80% of the development. So that's a significant burden and a significant obstacle. So it does need to have a full verification suite. We want to have a standard interface as possible, e.g. use Axie 4. And ideally, we should have some, some kind of proxy module for running simulations. Right? We shouldn't have to run the full DDR controller PCI interface when we're just running simulations. We should be able to bypass that for simulations at least for when we're simulating a whole like, end to end system. Uh, beam MPOC generator, is this possible in open source? I don't know, but like, I'm just kind of throwing that out there, like, is there a way to do this? Uh, easy to run chip layout generator. So this might be as simple as adding documentation to Qflow, uh, but I think there might be a need for some, some test cases though, uh, because like, I, mean, I, I hit issues very quickly and easily, but I might be just using it wrongly. All right, so thank you for listening. Very GPU aims to be an open source GPU ASEC dedicated to machine learning. It's got an extensive verification suite, like unit tests, integration tests, etc. We're calculating performance metrics for die area, propagation delay, and cycle count, and it's dedicated to machine learning. So we intend to use only Rainflow 16 in order to keep the die area low and the yield high. We intend to implement only floating point operations needed by ML, and we intend to ensure that it works with PyTorch. Cool. Thank you for listening. Hey. Who are you still with us? Hello? Uh, yeah, I'm still here, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. sorry, sorry, because we're some having some problems here, so I was wonder, I was very afraid that you were disconnected from us. Okay, so do anyone here have any questions? Okay, so do anyone here have any questions? Okay, so do anyone here have any questions? 
okay, so maybe we, we need to give them give them some time to think think about what they want to ask. But I, I have a question I want to ask with you that. Uh, Comparing to your work, like uh, there are many plenty of uh, open source GPU implementations regarding the GPU GPU one, such as the M A I uh, sorry M I A O W the Miao, you know the from uh, I be believe it's from some university in the in, in America, and there is a N U Z the N U N Y U Z I which is inspired by the uh, failed Intel Lava Lava B I, I believe. So, what is the design comparison between be, between theirs and yours? Because sim simply, the, uh, because apparently uh, your design is based on uh, risk five instruction set architecture instead of the existing and proven ones. So, this is my question. And please, uh, if 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 you allow me to <laughs> to, to to yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not very familiar with the other open uh, source. CPU out there. Um, there there's, there's one called Vortex, which I believe is targeting FPGAs, um, and I'm not familiar with the other one that you mentioned. I see, I see. Okay. So, um, so I have another question that's uh, kind of uh, straight away as well, but I, I'm really curious about that. Uh, you know, uh, back in maybe uh, one year or two years ago, there is another a uh, group of people would, would like to develop their own GPU based on the RISC-V instructions, risc -V ISA. So, but they chose to use the open power instead in, in the any hand. So, may I ask why do you want to use risc ISA as your base? I know that is it's very new, it's very cool, but uh, what is your concern here? Uh, your question is why I'm using RISC-V rather than some other ISA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, it just seems like a natural ISA to use because it's out there as open source and like lots of projects using it. Um, and I haven't come across any major issues with using it so far. I mean, the main issue that I will come across is the fact that I haven't found an extension for BF16 for the RISC-V. Uh, but it, it seems like it's got a lot of tooling support in general. Uh, so, like, what other ISAs would you think might be a good fit instead of RISC-V? Well, I'm not very sure, but some people are actually implementing their own uh, GPU GPU based on, I believe, it's ARM-based, which is uh, which is some kind of a uh, risky because you know they ARM won't, won't be happy that you're trying to re-implement their ISAs. But I know there are some groundworks there, but yeah, that's some some kind of <laughs> the, the try <laughs> anyways uh, so yeah here we, we have questions here please come come here because the the, the camera feed is here yeah okay. Okay. Hey, hi, thanks you for your presentation. Yeah, it is pretty significant that uh, your uh, GPU support the uh, PyTorch framework. Yeah, and I'm a bit interested that yeah, since we have uh, since PyTorch is a large framework and it uh, incorporates with Python and yeah, we also have uh, something like Unix or yeah, more static model that doesn't require a lot of uh, framework or a lot a lot of layer on top of that yeah and it also described the whole ai model yeah so yeah since you are talking to in machine learning so have you ever considering or yeah i would like to ask what is the benefit to support the whole pytorch layer instead of just onyx or any static model format yeah yeah so here here's the problem and yeah <laughs> yeah uh, so the question is, why am I targeting PyTorch rather than Onyx? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, for um, mm. I yes. guess I haven't thought about that question. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. So. So maybe this is a kind of profound questions that yeah. maybe you can. You can think about it and then maybe give us a reply <laughs> in one day or two or, or you know, in any time you want okay. would like to do that. Sorry that uh, because 
there, there are many yeah. kind of uh, DOAs here in Taiwan, that, yeah. and many DOA makers trying to do their own works. But just like the the people, the, the person here, that uh, many of them are targeting the static models instead of the PyTorch or you know the TF Lite because it requires the inter the, the, the interpreter. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, this some kind of. Uh, but anyways, this is open source. You can try to use it <laughs> and try yeah, to yeah. do your own work based on it. Yeah, I mean, I guess but the on Onyx is for inference, right? Whereas I'm targeting training. Oh, yes. So is that maybe the difference? Okay. I see. So basically, the open GPU or the very GPU here is stuck it in the you know. Yeah, bot, yeah, boss yeah, training. Yeah, yeah, but on the H training, and oh. that's the way that we can, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Like, I feel there's, there's a lot of work for inference, but um, for training, I'm, yeah, so, so I've, yeah, that was, I think that's, that's the reason, yeah, I think. I see, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions here? If not, uh, I, I still have a question here. <laughs> here so I'm, I'm curious that you're using very later for the, you know, this emulation, but uh, how is the speed that you're, you're, you're experiencing because you know very is uh, if I remember correctly they're adding the multi-thread support for the emulation but it's very buggy from my experience so did you use the multi-thread emulation or did you do just use the single thread uh, emulation model uh, uh, currently I'm just using the single-threaded or not yet using the multi-threaded I haven't tried multi-threaded yet okay I see that um, may be in the Okay, I see, I see. Uh, just a, one moment. I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in Mandarin to ask some people around here. Hello, <laughs> So Hugh, that uh, a person here that is actually our next speaker is will, will be presenting the, his own experience on the very later, and he's quite curious about your experience on using. Uh, that's only so SVA, ma. Uh, the the SVA in the the later. So I'm I'm not very familiar with that, but he he mentions about it, and he 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 wonder how's your experience on the SVA in the very later. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't remember what is SVA. Can you tell? Can you remind me what is SVA? Okay, I will ask him. Hello, SVA is what? System variable assertion. Okay, it's it is the system variable assertion. Okay, so system variable assertion. Uh, I'm just using the normal uh, variable assertions. I'm not using uh, assertions on the C plus plus side. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the for the for the, for the answering. And uh, just one more. I'm very curious about that. Do anyone fund you to actually tap it out? And you know there, are, uh, you know there is a chips bill that is passed in America. So I'm wondering that will you be interested in using you know the 90 nanometer process node or 100 130 nanometers process node from Skywater to tap out your, you know the very GPU. Uh, I haven't targeted finding funding yet. I think that's something for the future. Like once I've got more of a, once once it's more fleshed out and ready for taping out, then I will look into taping out and finding funding at that point. But not yet. I see. Well, that's your uh, talk is actually uh, kind of report here in Taiwan. So. I will definitely forward some interested parties to you, and we will be looking forward to it. And it's about time, so thank you very much for joining us, and sorry for waking you up so late in the in the United States. And bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening. We lost track of time. Hi, yo, five minutes, right? So we are, is it? 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 Is